Bowles. I welcome you all to our service this morning, those of you who are here and those of you who are worshipping at home. We trust that we will be blessed as we meet together this morning. And a special welcome from Mr. Richard Harvey. Um, we trust that he will be blessed as he ministers to us this morning. We're delighted to have him back. Just a few announcements for the incoming week. Um, the Knit and Natter, this is a preliminary announcement, they will recommence again on Tuesday the 1st of February, so not this week, uh, Tuesday the 1st of February. On Wednesday evening then, the MWI will meet. Um, sorry, Thursday, Thursday. <laughs> well, there's somebody to keep me right. Thursday evening, the MWI at 8pm, and the speaker is uh, Maureen McCourt, and her subject is Fit for Life. Uh, and that will be in the hall, so there'll be no faith mission prayer meeting this week. So that's Maureen McCord on Fit for Life. And then at 7.30 on Friday evening, the Bowles. Uh, next Sunday morning at 10.30, the Reverend Philip Gallagher will be along to take the service. And then on Monday the 24th, the World Day of Prayer team are having their second preparation meeting in St John's Hall in Crumlin at 8pm. The service itself will be held on the 4th of March in Gartree Parish Church. And anyone interested are welcome to attend the preparation meeting tomorrow evening. You might remember all these announcements in prayer. Thank you, Nigel. Good morning. Good morning. Are we all well this morning? All hiding behind your mask, I know you've got to, and I know we've got to. Oh, one day it'll finish, won't it? One, we'll, one day we'll be able to come and sit where we like in church with no mask on. And what a glorious day that will be. We're going to start our worship this morning by singing together number 116 in the Methodist hymn book, which is Sing We the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Let's stand and sing together.
let us come before God in prayer, let us pray together. Yes, Lord, you are our King, and we've come before you now to sing your praises. Lord, we are here because we want to be here. We want to praise you, we want to thank you, we want to worship you. Lord, as we come before you, we have so many things to thank you for. Things in, in life that we so often take for granted, our homes, our families, our friends, the love that is shared between us, for all the many, many gifts of food, of water. Lord, we have so much. And that's before we start thinking of the material things in life that we have to make our life so much easier. And then we think, Lord, of those who have nothing but the clothes they stand up in. Those who tonight will sleep out under the stars. Those who will have bellies that are empty, for they've had no food today. Those who will go to sleep thirsty because they have no fresh, clean water to drink. And those, Lord, who will be imprisoned for their faith because it is not allowed in their country. Lord, we have so, so much to thank you for, and so often we take it all for granted. So often, Lord, we, we start to get dissatisfied and to grumble. Lord, help us to be truly thankful, we pray now. Help us to appreciate everything that we have. But most of all, Lord, help us and show us how we can share with others so that they may have some of the great gifts that we have been given. But as we come before you, Lord, we also need to say sorry. Sorry for the times in this past week when we've gone our own way, we've done our own thing, when we've hurt you and we've hurt others. Lord, we want to say sorry now. We ask your forgiveness. Forgiveness that is free to all because of what you did on the cross when you died and rose again for us, for our sin. Lord, we thank you for the love that you showed us. You are such a loving God. So, Lord, we ask that you would bless this time that we spend together, that we may see a little more of you and your love, and that following this service, we might want to go out and to tell more people in this coming week about you and your love. In your name we ask this prayer. You taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'm sorry to say that there's no young people's talk this morning. I was going to say there's no young people here, but who's young at heart, anyone? Hi, there's a few hands going up, absolutely. Next time I promise you, I will bring something, I will bring something uh, for the, for, I'll say to the young at heart, we'll say to the young at heart. But there you go. Our readings this morning are taken from Matthew chapter 24. I'm beginning to read at verse 36 and then going to 25 and beginning to read again from verse 1. So it's Matthew 24, beginning to read at verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, 
one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house and been broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. I'm going on to chapter 25 and the first verse. At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. And all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us, both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later the others came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. May God bless his word to us this morning. We're going to stand and sing again. It's number 744. You'll know this one, I'm sure, a happy day that fixed my choice on me, my Saviour and my God. Let's stand and sing together.
two good hymns there, but they're a bit breathless, aren't they? Afterwards, it's like, whoa, especially with these masks, and you can't get the air in. You need to fill your lungs, that's what you need to do. When I was a very young lad, there was a song in the pop charts. I don't know how many of you remember the pop charts, as they were called. Before that, it was a hip parade. I was going to use the word hip parade until I found it was in the mid 50s, and that's too old for even me. But there we were, there was a song called Three Wheels on My Wagon. Anybody remember it? A few nods going off? Yes. It's probably now classified as being non-PC and shouldn't be broadcast. And that's probably why you've not heard it since. Uh, I don't know. I, I didn't really look into that side of it. It was a story of a hazardous journey made by an American pioneer family aboard a wagon being pursued by those pesky Cherokees with a wagon progressively losing each one of its wheels. And the song concluded with the Cherokees capturing the wagon, but being asked by the family to sing along in the final chorus. It was one of those fun songs of its day. It was a song that we would often be encouraged to sing to while away the miles on a long car journey. Other songs we sang were Yellow Submarine and Ten Green Bottles. You probably did similar. I don't know. But if it was a real long journey, we didn't realise at the time, but I do now and I realise, if it started a hundred green bottles, it was a really <laughs> long journey. My parents knew what they were up to. I didn't, in all innocence. In the 60s, that's the 1960s, car radios were rare. And they were seen as quite a luxury, never mind a tape player or a CD player. There wasn't any hooking up of an iPod to your in-car entertainment system, now known as ICE, apparently. Also, uh, internal combustion engine. You can get very confused with these abbreviations in the motor trade. There's no sticking in a, a flash drive or a pen drive uh, or streaming music, as, as the youngsters do today, from the mobile phones. Straight into the car, it goes none of that. There weren't any DVD or Blu-ray players either, uh, with built-in screens in the back of the headrests. We didn't have headrests in those days, although there were very few about. And there were no that clipped onto the back of the seats. No, these were the days of what I'm going to call real hardcore motoring. Car heaters had only just been introduced to Believe it or not, they were still an optional extra on many models. I know my dad, who was a mechanic, he actually made one, right? It was the crudest thing. He somehow tapped into the water system, brought a bit of copper pipe in through the bulkhead. It was like a curl, just a, a series of curls of this copper pipe and back into the engine bay. And there was no blower, no nothing. This thing just sat there and radiated. You were either burnt on one leg or the other, depending on whether you were driving or passenger, and if you were on the back seat, you just sat and chattered your teeth together. There was no air conditioning. No, if you were hot, you opened a window, or you sat there and sweated it out. I had a brother who every time I opened the window, I've got an earache, couldn't open the window for half a second without him crying, shut that window, shut that window, and it was like, oh, it was hard, hard work. If you're of a certain age, I'm sure you remember some of these days. If you're young enough, well, maybe you're very fortunate and you didn't have to go through them. Anyway, I digress as usual. The song Three Wheels on My Wagon was originally written and first released in 1961. Dick Van Dyke was the original artist, but it didn't catch on, it wasn't a hit. It took a, a year till 1962 when, and a bit of a tongue twister, the new Christie Minstrels, they released a cover version. You think cover version is a thing of the 2000s, it's not, they did cover versions then. And uh, they released a cover version and it became a, an instant hit. Now I didn't realise until recently that the lead singer in the new Christie Minstrels was the same guy that we later went to see perform as a Christian artist many years later when I was in my teens and his name is a fellow called Barry Maguire. You may or may not have heard of him. Yes, it was Barry Maguire, believe it or not, who 
who sang three wheels on my wagon. And we'd been singing along, not knowing that one day we'd just be sat watching him and listening to him at a concert all the way he'd come over from America. He became a Christian in the mid 70s and he brought a whole new style of Christian music. One of Barry's Christian songs stuck in my mind for years and it's in there and I don't think I'll ever get it out. It was quite revolutionary for its time. He sang this song about the second coming of Jesus and it's called He's Coming Back. Would anyone like to hear it? Yes, thank you. I'm glad you did, Charlotte. Anybody want to hear it? Because yeah. I've asked Nigel, he's, hopefully he's playing the DJ this morning. I'm going to ask Nigel if he can cue the music and it's, this is Barry Maguire, He's Coming Back.
Did you enjoy that? Yes. Or did you think, like my dad used to say, when you listen to modern pop music, that's like an old radio we used to have that was out of tune. <laughs> that's what he used to say about the music we used to listen to as youngsters. But he did like Barry Maguire, so he got a bit of taste. So it was something a little bit different. Um, he was some character Barry Maguire, Barry Maguire was. He got long hair. He got this big beard. Not, you, not what you expected to see in a 1970s church, unless you were looking at a picture of Jesus, a traditional picture of Jesus <laughs> with the long hair and the beard. It was almost, you know, heretical that people would, would, would be like this, you know, the three-piece suit and the, the hat and everything. You know, it was, it was so different. The 70s was a funny time. I'm not sure what life was like here in the 70s. I know you had your own troubles to deal with. But in England as a teenager growing up, we were constantly reminded that there was this threat of nuclear war. We were, after all, in the middle of the Cold War, which followed shortly after the Second World War. It started in 46, 1946, and lasted till 1991. The United States, the Soviet Union, and their allies were, were in a long, tense conflict which we knew as the Cold War. Though the parties were technically at peace, the period was characterised for uh, aggressive ar an aggressive arms race, proxy wars, and ideological bids for world dominance. We mustn't forget that the Second World War had just finished quite abruptly after two atomic bombs had been dropped on Japan at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For the first time, the world saw massive destruction in the blink of an eye. Whole cities flattened, now vaporised instantly. An estimated 120,000 people killed instantly. And afterwards, many more were dying from exposure to radiation. These bombings, I believe, truly shocked the world. And now two of the superpowers were at loggerheads with each other. And geographically, we were pretty well smack bang in the middle, halfway between. I don't know if you know, but some people say that the military buildings at the top of Divis. Anybody know that, Divis Mountain? That was actually a listening station in the Cold War, I believe for thing, activities that were going on in the North Atlantic. That's how close it was to people. Maybe growing up in the middle of that Cold War, this invisible war, affected us in some way. My recollection of the Cold War was that there was a real threat of nuclear war when I was in my teens. The threat was there that one of the leaders, the world leaders, would throw a wobbler, as they tend to do from time to time, and decide to hit that big red button, wherever it may be, and start a nuclear war. There were rumours which turned out to be true of government underground bunkers that were very secretively hid away in places we wouldn't know, where officials would go and they would continue to run the country should the warning be sounded and that red button be pressed. To add to the impending doom, some people were actually building nuclear shelters in their own homes and gardens in an attempt to survive a nuclear strike. Do you remember the public information films that came on TV? Protect and Save, they were called. Protect, sorry, they weren't, they were called Protect and Survive. There were a series of videos and, and information films, and they had the eeriest music and sound effects. They were designed to inform, but they really just put the fear of God into people. You can still look them up on YouTube today, if you fancy doing it, but... Let me tell you, it was, it was a strange period in our history. Yes, at the time, nuclear war looked like a real possibility. The threat of a war to end all wars was very real to us. And here was a guy, Barry Maguire, singing about the second coming of Jesus and the world coming to an end. It's quite funny because a few weeks back, we asked the young people at the Youth Fellowship in Craigmore we asked them, what questions do you want answered? We asked them as a sort of general uh, start to the, to the activities we were doing. 
And one of the questions one of the young people came back with was this, is Jesus coming back again? Is Jesus coming back again? Well, the answer is, yes, he most certainly is. Thankfully, they didn't ask when. That's a bit more of a difficult question to answer. We may see signs of the end times, as we have been doing for many, many years, but we must also remember that, as we read in our Bible reading, that no man knows the hour and no man knows the day. Maybe not even Jesus, just God the Father knows. The end times and the second coming of Jesus is a massive, massive subject. And we can't really do justice to it this morning other than scratch the surface. It's a subject that's been hotly debated over the years and a lot of detail is covered in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, the mysterious book almost, was a series of visions given to its author John and is known as apocalyptic literature. It's poetic, it's visionary and it expresses its meaning through symbols and imagery. To take this picture language literally or to treat this book as a logical timetable would probably be to go against the spirit of how it was written. What we do know though from what we are told in Revelation is that Jesus will return one day and when he does he will appear to everyone and that this second coming will be very different from the first time he came to earth. We've only just finished with Christmas, believe it or not. It's only a month ago, isn't it? Can you believe that? A month's gone since Christmas. Just seems like yesterday. But um, we just finished celebrating Christmas where we remember how quietly, now how almost low-key Jesus entered this world of ours for the first time. Not being born in a palace with a big show and, and everything else, but quietly in a stable. Now his second coming will be quite different. It will be spectacular. Everyone will know that he's returned in his glory and everyone will see the King of Kings returning to claim his own. On many occasions throughout history, there have been countless attempts by people to try to calculate when Jesus will return and when the end of time will be. Some have been so convinced that they're correct um, and they've worked it out absolutely perfectly that they've actually publicised it, made a big scene about the end of the world is coming, it'll be on such and such a date. But every time that date came and went, they were wrong. Yes, we have seen some of the signs that are mentioned in the beginning of Matthew chapter 24. This is what it says there. We didn't read this bit as part of our reading. Tell us, the disciples said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming? and the end of the age. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. The signs have been there for many years and will continue to be about. It's funny at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, when we started to see how utterly devastating and destructive this virus has been. And we started our first lockdown and the world fire felt like, well, it had almost stopped, didn't it? The world was shut all of a sudden. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. Some people thought, hmm, the end of the world is nigh. Only God the Father knows when Jesus will return. One thing we should note from our reading is that he will return when we expect it least. Matthew 24 and verse 44 says this, So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. If anyone ever tell you, tells you that they know that Jesus is coming again, my advice to you is to ignore them, for no man knows the hour, only God. 
However, there is one thing that we can do today in preparation for the day he returns. And that's to do exactly what it says in the Bible. And that's to watch and to pray. Whether we are physically alive on earth when Jesus comes again, or have already been called home, remains to be seen. But in the meantime, we are called to watch and to pray. Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 25, verse 13. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. We are called to be ready to keep watch and to pray, busying ourselves with God's work, looking out for the things that he would want us to be doing, looking out for others, caring for others, loving others, lovingly telling others about God's love, putting others first, serving others, following Jesus' example. As it says in the song, The Servant King, so let us learn how to serve and in our lives enthrone him. Each other's needs to prefer. That's a difficult one. Each other's needs to prefer for it is Christ we're serving. Is there anything for us to fear? Well, the best thing about being a Christian in times of uncertainty is this. If we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and as our Saviour, we actually have nothing to fear. We know where we're going and we know where we're going to spend eternity. I was once, by, once asked by a young person, would it be okay to do a particular thing? It wasn't rob a bank or anything like, like that, it was, it was something, you know, it, it's alright if I do this. And I thought about it for a minute or two and then I thought, how do you answer this? How do you answer this? There's nothing in the Bible that says you must not do whatever this modern thing was. And in the end, I said this to him, if Jesus returns today and you're doing that thing, would you be happy for him to see you acting in that way and doing that thing? Would you be happy letting him see you do it? And that's the answer I gave him and, and I let him go away and think about that. And obviously, I don't know whether he did or he didn't. I'm not a clue. But Jesus could come when we least expect him. We're called to be alert, to look out for opportunities in the meantime, to be truly watching and spending time in prayer to do his work while we patiently wait for the return of our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, yes, we, we are waiting patiently for your return. We don't know when it will be. We're told it's when we least expect it. Lord, we pray this morning that you'll help us to busy ourselves with the work that you want us to do and that you would help us to look out for others. That we might look for opportunities where we can show love and caring for others too. Help us, Lord, to be able to tell others of your love in a, a loving way, non judgmental, and put others first in our lives. Lord, help us, help us, Lord, to learn how to serve to serve as you did, as a servant king who came to this earth to save us from our sin. Help us to follow your example. In your name we ask this prayer. Amen. Our closing hymn is taken from Mission Praise. It's number 759, but it's on the Scream, because we now have books. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather 
over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Let's stand and sing.